Hello and welcome to the Kitchen Conversations podcast. My name is Patricia Rozvora and I'm the host of this platform where we speak about contemporary art from so-called Eastern Europe. In each episode, you're going to be introduced to one artist or researcher whose visual or activist practice sheds light onto the complex former socialist region with all its histories, cultures, languages, foods, but also traumas and their inevitable contemporary consequences. The podcast is a fully independent platform existing since May 2020. If you enjoy the monthly conversations, you can support me via Patreon or share the episode with your friends or via social channels. So welcome, Isada, to Kitchen Conversations. Where are you calling from? Where are you located at the moment? Uh, I'm currently in Brooklyn and New York. That's where you live? That's where you work? This is where I live. Um, I work in New Jersey, so um, where I go to my school for my PhD. Um, I'm currently not doing any coursework, so I just go on campus to teach. So I teach uh, sociological theory, classical sociological theory. My commute currently is like two-ish hours. This will be the first episode of this year also. Quite a theoretical one, since you are uh, an academic, you work with uh, text, with theory, and I thought, why not start the year with that? But I got (laughs) to know your work through some art circles here in Berlin, uh, which I think is a nice uh, combination, and I feel you also... Uh, have some of this in your work as well at least how your writing is in my opinion quite accessible and in a way quite visual as well for the very beginning perhaps uh, how did you uh, find yourself doing what you do how did you find yourself becoming a yeah, researcher a scholar uh, and working with the topics uh, you work with I think I well I was very much into school I guess <laughs> and I was very Studying. much into reading mm. yeah and uh, what I found when I was taking classes I think as an undergrad was that other people in the classroom they found it annoying like when the teacher would ask a specific question about like oh like what does this argument mean but I found it like fascinating because I could like decipher what the person wrote about a specific thing from their text and it made me think about things I've never thought about before I found it very like intellectually stimulating and um and I, I guess I always w- liked writing and I kind of saw it as a bridge between doing research and writing um which kind of signaled to me that academia is the the right career pathway for me. But as you said, um, like when you were talking earlier about uh, the conversation being theoretical, I really hope it won't be because I think a lot of the times people have this idea that theory is something that is extremely abstract and very like intangible, very hard to use, something that's almost um, maybe unnecessary, maybe people don't have time for it when they're like living their actual lives, facing actual problems. And uh, what I I think and what I found by reading a lot of series uh, across like different disciplines from anthropology to sociology to gender studies uh, to political science is that Siri is extremely important in understanding of the world. So it is something that we all actually need. But because academia as a field, it, it is quite inaccessible and it is quite focused on basically perpetuating the same structures of uh, sharing thoughts and ideas that are usually locked into, you know, like journal articles, uh, like theoretical books, like there's a certain idea of how you should present your academic intellectual thoughts. And I think it's not something that I necessarily align with. And I necessarily agree with when it comes to sharing my work. That's why most of my work is in open access. Growing up and um, studying in undergrad, I, I was really into the question of gender and the question of women's rights and women's position within a society, specifically in Kazakhstan, which is where I was born and raised and where I attended uh, my undergrad. It was the time before feminism became, I would say, quite mainstream and like quite 
neoliberal, you know, like when people started like putting it on t-shirts and everything. I think that was like maybe like one or two years before. And I found it quite challenging to engage with people in conversation about it. And I didn't find a lot of scholars, a lot of books. And I thought that if there's not a lot of information on women's rights and women's uh, positionality in Kazakhstani society, then maybe I should research it. <laughs> During the first year of my studies, the January uh, protest happened in Kazakhstan, and then the full escalation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine happened in February. This was all during my first year. And so I think during that time, I kind of shifted away from gender and sexuality to um, political activism, to questions of imperialism, questions of decolonization. Um, I've studied them before, and I've practiced them in my research before, but I never fully focused on them. But since the events in the region kind of unfolded in that way, it kind of took me in a direction of studying decolonial discourses and Russian imperialism, which is not something I necessarily imagined myself doing like maybe four years ago. I really want to produce knowledge for Central Asian communities that comes from a place of proximity and sort of like intimacy with Central Asian community because I am Central Asian and I grew up in Kazakhstan. Um, and I think so often Central Asia as a field is very much under Eurasian studies, Slavic studies. It is very much positioned as like an addendum, like, you know, like an extra to other uh, areas of study. And a lot of the times it is dominated by scholars who come from outside of Central Asia to study it. And they might not have the ties to the community in the same way, or might, they may like adopt like a certain view of Central Asia, like based on like, you know, like its history, its connection to Russia. And so I, I saw that it would be a good idea f to have like more scholars in Central Asian studies doing research on our own communities and producing knowledge that is less, I would say, to borrow from the colonial theory, like uh, epistemically violent towards communities. So I guess this is a very long story of how I got here. <laughs> and what are the languages uh, you use in your practice? In the line of being uh, at the Western institution, I mostly write in English. And then it is unfortunate to say that being on my, I'm going to say like over, like approaching like 10 years of like education and attending English speaking schools, I kind of lost my skills of writing in other, because I think like writing is such a specific process. It's very hard to write in a language that you don't practice Uh, necessarily all the time or you don't practice by reading theory in that language and because I read and I consume theory and literature mostly uh, in English I kind of like the strongest skill I have currently is writing in English and then whenever I want my works to be accessible in other languages I actually connect with other people and I ask them sometimes I uh, if I'm able I, I pay them a small amount sometimes I ask them to do it on a voluntary basis and I ask them to translate my works into Russian and Kazakh it's a good practice to indeed work with translators then just like write uh, in few languages or you know use one language that you feel the strongest in and then give uh, you know the, the space to the translator to to help you with your words in another language i definitely feel uh, feel that as well since i speak uh, three languages at the same time yeah somehow in each language i'm also a bit of a different person and each language is reserved for a bit of a different part of my life and the working language is definitely english for me i think of kazakh language as a language that is reserved between like me and my grandmother, like it's resolved in, in spaces of me and my family. And it's very hard for me to, also because I come from the north of Kazakhstan, which is um, closer to Russia and our use of Kazakh language has not been as frequent, uh, I would say, as in the south, for example, of the country. So I think that part is also kind of, there's a lot of, contexts like working at the same time when it comes to 
speaking Kazakh versus speaking Russian, especially because currently we have such a charged political atmosphere when it comes to speaking Russian. Um, even this week, there's uh, just been this like um, event or kind of like news in the in the media about this very famous like um, media person in Russia who made a statement saying that essentially in Kazakhstan that we scapegoat Russian speakers and we ban Russian language and that we are like being in some ways maybe xenophobic and we are renaming streets, we're renaming like different like buildings, etc. Um, and uh, it, it generated a lot of discourse um, like among Kazakhstani people because um, there's this idea that a lot of us speak Russian and we have a tie to the language in a way that I... I learned Russian before I learned Kazakh as a kid. Um, Russian was the language that was spoken at my home. So it does feel like my language, you know, but it's very hard to call it a mother tongue because it is a, a language that has not been indigenous to Kazakhstan or it's a language that has been used in many ways um, in the process of um, imperial expansion and the Soviet expansion. And so it carries this particular heritage in itself that is very hard to separate from its historical context. But at the same time, it is impossible to deny that people speak it, that people are comfortable with it, that um, someone may not know Kazakh right now. And even though I try to speak it more than I've ever did in my life now, and I think it's very important, but I also don't want to th think that someone who speaks Russian, um, who grew up in Kazakhstan like me, um, feels like maybe uncomfortable or unwelcome in their own country where they grew up because like they their Kazakh might not be as good. So I think there's so many layers to that question of language. Even when you first asked me that, it kind of caused a bit of panic in me. I was like, oh, wait, it do wasn't I tell her? the draft, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, I was like, oh, do I tell her a short version or do I tell her all the traumas that I feel yeah. like in relation to language? No, and of um, course it, it directly uh, relates to the text we want to... Uh, speak mm -hmm. about to, to your work, to your written piece. And uh, interestingly that just now um, this happened in the news, what you just told, because of course it, it shows that, uh, yeah, your research is so relevant. You wrote this piece uh, yeah, in summer 2023, but still, of course, it's very much current discussion. Here I'm referring to an article written by Aizada for South-South Movement titled Decolonial Disruptions in Central Asia Understanding Reactions to Russian Migrants in the Wake of Putin's Mobilization. So what happened is that in September 2022, Putin's administration issued partial mobilization of um, specifically yeah, like male, male citizens of Russia to get them conscripted to go to war against Ukraine. It was kind of um, a sudden move and it generated this migration crisis where from the end of September, uh, during the next couple, like a few months, thousands of uh, people have been trying to move away from Russia. And many of them went through Central Asia just because we share such a long border with Russia and also there is no requirement to have a passport to cross the border between Russia and Kazakhstan. So, for example, to cross the border between Russia and Georgia, um, you don't need a visa, but you do, you do need a passport. Uh, to cross the border between Russia and Kazakhstan, you don't need a passport. You just need um, an ID. Same goes in direction moving from Kazakhstan um, to uh, Russia, or at least it used to be. So I think it created um, these conditions under which a lot of people felt like, they felt the urgency and uh, I'm sure they felt a lot of emotions, including fear, and they, they moved. Um, I would say that since then, because it's been more than a year at this point, as far as I know, many of those people who migrated to Central Asia after the uh, partial mobilization last September, they actually moved back. Um, or some of them moved to other places like uh, further away. So I don't think that Central Asia became like a major uh, destination for most of those people, but a lot of them did stay. Um, and it did change, I guess, the 
the general environment in the country to some extent. The reason I started to want to write about it is because I kept seeing it in the news and from very different perspectives. So uh, one thing that uh, led me to write about it, which is in the paper, is uh, there's this business owner who is um, extremely successful and extremely uh, rich. <laughs> and he held a meeting with those people who came from Russia. Like he, he, like it was kind of like an open event where he was welcoming them basically to a Kazakh to the country. Uh, business owner, right? Um, yeah. I would, I, I'm not sure what's his ethnic identity. He is a Kazakhstani person. He is a citizen of Kazakhstan. I think he was, um, as far as I know, I think he was born and raised in Kazakhstan um, and he works there, everything. I'm not sure that he, ethnically he is Kazakh. I, I, I would not um, be confident to say that. But yeah, so like he had a meeting with a lot of people, like like potential employees that could join the company and everything. And in that meeting, he kind of like, ah, I think it was a press conference. Yes. And during that press conference, he said that people who only want to speak Kazakh are doing so because they're not, well, he was saying that they don't have, a, they're not cultured, basically. Like someone who only speaks Kazakh and someone who will insist on speaking to you in Kazakh, they're basically, the implication was that they are backward and like maybe they are not the people you want to associate with. And so um, the, the scene was basically that this person who has a lot of resources, who has a lot of power and who has access to give uh, employment, to give resources to people, he was uh, positioning it in a way that people who are very much traditionally Kazakh or who are like um, just just speak Kazakh so they are like disconnected from the Russian uh, like media from um, the Russian culture that they are not very developed people like they're not like they're you shouldn't expect much from them you shouldn't pay attention to them and that uh, rightfully caused uh, a lot of controversy uh, online on social media and then those things kind of continued here and there you would uh, people started suddenly like um, pointing out that um, there is a lack of menus being offered in restaurants in Kazakh language that all of it is kind of geared towards Russian speaking people and I guess before it wasn't such an issue because because we did not have a situation where there was an influx of migrants from Russia coming in. Even if there were issues uh, for like just Kazakh-speaking populations in the country, I guess there was a different perspective on them. And it didn't seem like it was an issue of us versus them. It was more of an internal issue within the country. But after that situation changed, and then we also came under scrutiny of the international community, and we had um, certain opinions and like news articles, like opinion essays about the situation where they talked about how Central Asia could benefit from all the professionals that are coming in from Russia, that they will take Central Asia, like especially like in tech to like new heights. And there has been kind of some sort of like, um, I guess, tendency for uh, employers to maybe prioritize people who are coming from Russia, because especially those who are coming from larger cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, because they were seen as people coming from basically the metropole um, of, of the, the Soviet, post-Soviet space. And um, they were positioned as highly professional cadre, like highly professional individuals that have advantage over local Central Asian talent. And I think I was absorbing all of that uh, happening at the same time. And I kind of wanted to dive deeper into why people are upset, like why some people are upset and why some people cannot seem to understand like why some groups perceive it as threatening or why is it not okay to, to say that uh, ca only Kazakh-speaking populations are not as cultured or not as developed. I've been seeing all of those things and I kind of wanted to, and it, it has been so recent and so unprecedented in a way that I wanted to take some time and maybe try to digest it and try to 
um, connected to larger issues and larger uh, colonial contexts because I, I don't think there is, there is something extremely unique about Central Asia, that is for sure. It is something that v- makes it very hard for us to relate to other people, you know, like to other groups. Like we understand a lot of people who also come from post-colonial countries, but at the same time, very few of them know about our history or they even consider us as a post-colonial country. So there is always this gap between specifically like Central Asia and other and then there is this gap between Central Asia and like Central and Eastern Europe or Balkans. Exactly. Yeah, because there is this, uh, in this sense, we are much, uh, we have more in common, I would say, with North Asia and Siberia in a way that Central Asia has been perceived by the Tsarist Russia during the Russian imperial time and then later on during the Soviet times as a, um, the other, like as this group of people who have different religion because they're Muslim and not Christian, uh, who look differently because uh, they're Asian and they have, yeah, like a Mongolian uh, ancestors. Um, and then also at the same time, they have uh, very different languages. They, ha- they have Turkic languages. Um, and then they also have uh, quite different lifestyles. So if we're talking about Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, um, people were practicing nomadic lifestyles. So they did not have the same level of agriculture and um, like urbanization prior to the Tsarist Empire and the Soviet Union. So all of that kind of made... Central Asia and um, North Asia as well, but in, in its, own, its own way, um, it made uh, Central Asia this own like Orient, its own other uh, party for the Soviet Union, which there is a, a way to kind of um, find evidence for that throughout history. So, for example, Kazakhstan has the largest uh, number of gulags in the country that has been put there during uh, the Soviet regime. This has been the place, like, um, basically, like, middle of nowhere, where you send people to suffer. (laughs) Like, you don't care. And then the first space station was, is also in Kazakhstan. It is just far enough from the metropole, from Moscow. To do just all in the case. experiments. <laughs> yes, exactly. And to this day, that that uh, that town is still owned, like considered to be part of Russian Federation. And Russia is technically paying rent to Kazakhstan for that land, uh, which whether or not it's fair pay uh, is uh, up for discussion. And then also uh, there was a nuclear plant for nuclear testing in um, the east of Kazakhstan, um, which was um, also like it produced a lot of radiation. There was never an actual um, accident the same way it was in Chernobyl in Ukraine. But to this day, there are children still born with like certain disabilities. The effects of radiation are very much ongoing. And then if you look further, like if you look into Uzbekistan, the extraction of cotton led to like a lot of environmental disasters. And all of it was based on this very extractive relationship where things would be taking away from um, Central Asia for the greater benefit, the greater purpose of the Soviet Union. So like the space race, um, the scientific breakthroughs in like uh, nuclear power, um, all of those things. And um, a lot of the times this was done without necessarily giving much back to those communities and still viewing those communities as cheap labor, as um, communities that are perhaps less capable of uh, modernization, less capable of being, um, of developing at at the same pace as uh, the metropole. So I think all of those things kind of set up this dynamic that has been present there for decades. And then when we saw the level of migration spiking from Russia to Central Asia, I guess it it triggered a lot of things that were already there under the surface. And so that's why it's, it, for me, it was very important to discuss this uh, situation that occurred last September in the context of everything that happened, specifically connected to the ways through which people process colonialism, the ways through which um, they make sense of it. And that's why I connected it to a lot of series uh, by different scholars to try to kind of 
And a lot of those scholars did not write about Central Asia at all. They wrote about the African continent, the colonies of the, of the French Empire. So like, and I had to find connections to kind of, um, take some things out of those series and show the way it works, um, in the context of Central Asia and in the context of the recent, uh, migration situation that we had. What I, what I thought, uh, was very important to see the situation, the current situation, uh, caused by the migration as in the context of coloniality and not, uh, as something uh, as a result of Russian colonialism that is kind of in the past and now has to be processed, but it is a continuation of that, which uh, I thought was very, very telling and really changing somehow the discussion also, if we see something as a continuation and not as something just uh, there. And uh, I think at this point, I would uh, like to ask you to to tell about the contemporary politics in Kazakhstan, because I think it's also important for listeners uh, to understand uh, how the country developed since uh, its uh, independence from the Soviet Union. Yeah, so I think um, our proximity to, like for all Central Asia, but for Kazakhstan specifically, our proximity to Russia has been a major factor in the way the country has developed since um, the fall of the Soviet Union. And since Kazakhstan was the last Central Asian country to declare independence, <laughs> it was uh, really a touch and go <laughs> for until the last moment. When was um, that? It was, I think, uh, 1991. Mm-hmm. And because it's so hard to escape the influence of um, the empire when you are right there and when... Um, economically like you have to trade with them you have to like have like diplomatic relationships with them so for example when we think about um the colonies uh, on the on the african continent or if we think about latin america a lot of the times the distance between them and their uh, like between post colonial countries and their previous uh colonizers in some ways it can be helpful in having the space to rethink about the geographic uh, distance the physical yeah. distance between also get the space to find its own contemporary political identity but because Kazakhstan remains so close to Russia like always um, a lot of the times it has been positioned on international arena as kind of the satellite state of of Russia uh, recently there was um, Emmanuel Macron he came to visit uh, Kazakhstan I think in November, on uh, Bloomberg News, <laughs> put a, a headline of saying that Macron is visiting Russia's backyard. Oh, so yeah, they yeah. called Kazakhstan, yeah, like Russia's backyard, and um, which is yes, extremely inappropriate, but also extremely telling that this is the way the world views Kazakhstan. And when they want something um, from Russia, or maybe they want to like go around Russia or go around China, um, they they. They come to Kazakhstan. So I think this positionality of being so close to your uh, colonizer and being viewed by international parties as you kind of belonging to it has affected. Um, and it's also, I'm not saying that this is entirely uh, has been done to Kazakhstan against uh, Kazakhstan's government will. No, a Kazakhstan government actively works on nurturing those relationships w- uh, with Russia. It's actively trying to uh, like navigate uh, the diplomatic relationship uh, with Russia. And also we have China on the other side. So all of those things are um are working uh, together to uh, to create this specific relationship with Russia, where Kazakhstan is definitely positioned as on a lower side uh, of the hierarchy. Also, because the government that uh, was installed uh, in Kazakhstan in the 1990s, after it gained independence, it was the government that has been uh, favored by the Communist Party, like the people who were uh, who who reached power in independent Kazakhstan. A lot of them already had power in Soviet Kazakhstan, so the transition of power did not really. Um, 
did that really happen in a way that uh, we gained independence, we had elections, and then we like it went from there? It was more like the process of independence was carried out by the same elites and the same parties that were involved in the Soviet Union and that were also involved in um, safeguarding and extending relationship with newly independent uh, Russian Federation. So all of those things... Um, they set the context for um, continuous, uh, very close relations between Kazakhstan and Russia. It, it became extremely obvious during the bloody January protests when the president asked Vladimir Putin to bring their troops to help deal with the protests, which a lot of people in Kazakhstan found to be sort of a betrayal in a way where Russia was invited to come and deal with um, its own people, like the people of Kazakhstan, which it did not make any sense at that time. For any of the of your listeners who do not know anything about Kazakhstani politics, well, it's actually very easy to learn about all the presidents of the country because there's only been two in the history of independent Kazakhstan. You don't have to Kazakhstan. count much, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We had the same um, president, the authoritarian leader, the dictator from the very start of uh, independent Kazakhstan up until 2019. Basically, my entire life, I like my country only had one president and this was the main person, you know, like there was very much um, the cult of like personality, the cult of leadership being developed by um by the president. Um, it is quite intense, uh, especially for me to think about because where I'm coming from, I'm coming from um, Astana, which is the capital city of Kazakhstan. And um, the thing about my hometown is that it used to be extremely small and extremely rural up until it was selected to be the capital in 1997, if I remember correctly. When it was selected to become the capital, um, Nusutan Nazarbayev, the authoritarian leader of the country, he kind of took it as his own project to showcase modernization of the country, the the country's entrance into capitalism and free market and like moving away from the Soviet uh, era, including like Soviet architecture, Soviet aesthetics and entering the modern, the new age, the 21st century, you know. And so a lot of money that the country made from oil uh, industry uh, went into my hometown to create this uh, like fairy tale image, and if you Google um, uh, Astana, Kazakhstan, you will find lots of different architecture. I you did will that, find. and I was somehow yeah. very surprised of how it yes. looks to you the f- image of what I thought it would look like. Exactly, and this has been, I think, this has been the goal of them. You will find a building that looks like an egg. You will find a building that looks like a tent, a pyramid, a giant ball. Um, a giant ball sitting on a tree. Like, you'll find many things. <laughs> and um, all of those things affected my hometown dramatically in a way that, um, like, where my mom was born, where her family lived, we saw, like, the rapid change, the rapid gentrification of it all, um, and the change of identity. And I went to, the high school that I went to was called after Nazarbayev. The college that I went to was called after him. Like um, at some, in 2019, the city was renamed after him for, for two years. It was, it was named Nur, Nur Sultan, which for me personally, it has been such a ridiculous and also like almost like traumatic thing to have your hometown be renamed after the dictator. So I feel like I, I had this um, proximity to the building of new Kazakhstania identity because I lived in the in, in Astana and I saw the way it was changing. I saw the way it was changing for my mom's family who all were living there for like decades before. Um, and I saw the way that it implied a lot of modernization. It implied this like very flashy picture that was put out there to the world, but I also saw that it was based a lot of the times on corruption. A lot of the times it was ineffective, like the buildings would take so long to, to be built. There was like so much corruption involved, um, like so much payouts, uh, only certain people would get richer and the poor would like get poorer. So um, observing all of those things, um, I guess, 
makes me very critical about the history of independent Kazakhstan and um, the way that the ruling elites have been um, treating people and the way they've been taking care of people. And they are not even elected officials. So like, it's not as if like they owe anyone anything in a way that like no one ever elected them, not really. Uh, but they always talk about their duties and responsibilities to the people. But I would say that it's very hard to see that um, to be implemented in practice. And not only when it comes to economic inequalities, but also when it comes to social issues, such as violence against women and children, uh, the protection of the uh, LGBTQ plus community, which is that protection is currently non-existent. My following question would be, and then about the people, because now, of course, you, you spoke about those who run the country and those who kind of transitioned from Soviet Kazakhstan to independent Kazakhstan and kind of prolonged their legacy in their own way, collecting the money for their elites and building the symbolic cities, which, uh, yeah, the local communities perhaps, yeah, don't get so much out of it or aren't so involved. So I'm curious how actually the the people, the, the civil society is acting upon, uh, yeah, the, the past decades. You were writing in your text about the bloody January, so forms of resistance and forms of yeah, going out of the streets and showing... Um, people's uh, view on on contemporary uh, politics, but perhaps also uh, how activism and various self-organized groups uh, are developing in Kazakhstan and how do you observe that? Kazakhstan EU's had um, quite a long history of actually going out on the streets and making their voices heard. Um, it is lesser known fact that uh, in 1989, no, Yes, 1986. So what happened, it was um, in Almaty, which is the biggest um, city in Kazakhstan. And it's also one of the larger cities in Central Asia. And um, that city, like Almaty, saw protests by students against the appointment of the new um, general secretary, I believe, uh, or general director of the uh, Communist Party in Kazakhstan. And so um, the <clears throat> what happened was that the new person who was appointed was from Russia and, and was ethnically Russian. And um, students came out on the streets in 1996 protesting it and like um, basically advocating for more self-governance, advocating for more say in, in political rights and political issues and governance. So, and that protest had been quite violently uh, suppressed by the Soviet authorities. Um, and it has been part of the protests like all over, um, all over the um, Eastern Bloc at that time, which I'm, mm. I'm sure as you know, like in Poland as well, it was happening. And, and, yes. Yeah. And so it has been in Kazakhstan. So, there is this legacy of um, protesting and activism that does exist in Kazakhstan, but it, ha it has been um, largely, I guess, pushed to the background, um, especially by the government. It, it doesn't really doesn't really boast around about those protests. Um, and then we saw the unprecedented spike in uh, civil activism since uh, 2019 when we had the change uh, of power when the Nusrat he stepped uh, he stepped down and he appointed a successor who was not ele elected democratically and um, and then who then proposed to change the name of the capital city after Nazarbayev. And all of those things happening at the same time with such uh, blatant disregard for the people, where we as citizens were just spectators, just trying to figure out what was happening. So that prompted actually a lot of like, I would say like some people have been calling it uh, the Kazakh Spring, where it is a time when there was there this like, rising of consciousness, of political consciousness, of civil consciousness um, all over the country, but also specifically in Almaty, which remains like the cultural hub and also the 
the epicenter of activism and uh, and protesting. But at the same time, this also resulted in the protests in, in January of 2022 to become um, violently suppressed by the government, um, ending up uh, in the deaths of like over 230 people and in the uh, jailing of many protesters, of many journalists, um, of people who were just passing by and maybe just happened to be at a certain place at a certain time. And to this day, there is very little like uh, of a, an official narrative that we have about those events. Um, there are many like think pieces, many research papers, many books. Um, like there are many sources that you can look into that try to piece together the picture of what happened, uh, who exactly was benefiting um, like from those protests, um, the tug of power between the elites, etc. But what we know, what we actually have is the death of civilians. We have the persecution of uh, activists, of uh, journalists, authors, etc., which like continues to this day. Um, I was in Kazakhstan this summer, and during that time, they have sentenced two journalists for the participation of January events. So, like all of those things, they are still ongoing, and I think they represent this turn in Kazakhstan's independent history when people are more willing to communicate with one another, to uh, show up for one another, and also to maybe become more aware about the way that different contexts are at work uh, when it comes to like events that are happening in Kazakhstan. Because there are people out there who do talk about Russian colonialism, who do talk about um, the coloniality that is still experienced by um, Kazakhstani people, and they include that in their protests. But then there are also people who talk more about the rights of Kazakhs who live outside of the country, specifically Kazakhs and Uyghurs who are uh, in concentration concentration camps in China, then there are people who are more concerned with um, the questions of gender and sexuality in the country, others with political participation. So I would say currently the scene of civil activism in in Kazakhstan, it is extremely diverse and it is definitely, I would say, thriving despite the efforts of the government that they continue jailing uh, people, they continue persecuting people. But so many of those activists are young, so many of them are uh, also like highly educated, so many of them live in Almaty and um, they are, they created this like more of a tight knit community where they're able to support each other, like in terms of safety, but also sometimes maybe financially, emotionally, etc. So I can see that there is this network being built. There is this um, group of people existing that are are very much known for for their activism, known for their critical view of the government. And the fact that it happens right now, I would say is already a huge progress because I did not, we did not have that when um, like 10 years ago, I would say, or like um, any earlier time, like when I was growing up, when I was living in Kazakhstan. So despite the fact that yeah, like we only had two presidents. And like, if you look at the action, like uh, just on paper, you look at the history of like uh, politics in Kazakhstan, you would say like, oh yeah, it's like an authoritarian country. Like doesn't matter. Like there's not much there. Um, there is. If you live there, yeah. Like if you live there, if you talk to people, um, you know that people are not just like taking things lying down. It's not as if everyone is a passive recipient. And I think it's very extremely inspiring, especially for me when I when I write my research and I try to engage with those groups. And exactly in uh, in relation to to your research and how we started the conversation about speaking language, can you give some examples of uh, decolonial education and in terms of the linguistic resistance of uh, how the implementation of Kazakh language is uh, being put uh, forward uh, and perhaps uh, in places where Russian was the uh, the first language being used uh, before that? Well, there are so many activists who are, well, not all of them are like full-time activists, but there are people who, like I said before, like they go out to places, specifically a lot of like, you know, like, 
I guess, downtown places, like, you know, like those places that are um, very popular and um, sometimes quite fancy and urban. And they ask people, how are they including only Kazakh-speaking populations? How are they making them welcomed to, to in these environments? And a lot of the times when those things first, when those people first started going to those places, no one had any answer. People were kind of exasperated at the, at the sort of like being asked to create a menu in Kazakh. So thinking of um, restaurants, bars. Yeah, uh, restaurant, kind of bars. Places. And then also like such things even like as a, as an app for your local bank. <laughs> like not, some of them did not exist in Kazakh uh, up until recently. So I think like in terms of like linguistic, there are so many people who go out there and like actually talk point to people. Point out. It, yeah. And they also point out the idea that if you are a Kaz like only Kazakh speaking person and you're trying to like book an appointment at a hair salon or something, a lot of the times you're going to struggle a lot. Uh, like specifically depending, like if you are like in Almaty or in Astana, like, you know, like big cities that are supposed to be like hubs of culture, it's very hard to get by like just using um, Kazakh language. So like there are people who deal with that. I know people who are also have dedicated themselves into translating uh, movies. They create captions in Kazakh language uh, because for the longest time, um, movies have not been dubbed in, in Kazakh language. We only received movies from Russia, so they were always dubbed in Russian. And then for like recently in the last few years, we started introducing um, uh, subtitles in Kazakh. So this has been a change for people. And then I know people right now who are like doing those subtitles themselves. Like they, they just want to translate certain movies for people and they engaged in, in this activism. And then there are also, of course, the host of uh, certain events that are being prioritized, like Kazakh is being prioritized during these events. So like there is a discussion group and um, they announced that they, the priority language, the language of uh, speaking will be Kazakh. There are also a lot of people who have uh, been trying to create resources for people who try to learn Kazakh. So they recognize that there is a problem that people don't speak Kazakh. So they offer like online resources. Then they there also have been people who have started like, you know, like those speaking clubs, which is like this amateur, uh, basically like get togethers of people where it's not necessarily about learning the, the structures of the language, the grammar, just but it's about just, yeah, just speaking. Mm -hmm. There are many, many ways through which so many people have been trying to engage with the question of, the Kazakh language and the question of Kazakh identity, they kind of come hand in hand um, in a way that there are people who are trying to target language specifically, but what they're addressing is the, the issue of identity, the issue of that to be someone who is a, a Kazakh person or a Kazakhstani person who lives in Kazakhstan, you have to be open to accommodating different people was there uh, on like language abilities and just speaking Russian does not necessarily make anyone like more civil or more um, easier to talk to, easier to communicate. And then there are also people who are in art. I've seen a lot of uh, artists that they create uh, like exhibits that are, they may not be directly about language, but they are about reclaiming your identity as a Kazakh person. Um, it, it is about reclaiming your view of certain maybe cultural settings, uh, certain settings of our childhood, of our families that maybe we have tended to view as, yeah, very um, uncivilized, very like not like modern settings. And now reclaiming those settings, reclaiming that identity, certain ethnic um, narratives ethnic i would say visuals a lot of a lot of them relate to visuals and styles etc and um seeing how they can be incorporated into contemporary kazakhstani identity also there is a whole uh, like renaissance of kazakh music that that is also happening oh, which has been ex yeah which has been extremely fun to to listen to and uh um, there has been some music festivals that people organized. Like overall, I don't know. It, I, I would say that so far it has been a great time. Not to romanticize. Uh, we have a lot of issues, but 
whenever you, I go to Kazakhstan and I see what people are doing, it is extremely inspiring. You feel proud. I do. And I also feel guilty in many ways because I am not there. I'm yeah. kind of stuck in between. I'm also curious, uh, maybe a bit of a provocative question, and I also didn't write it on the draft, but it just came to mind and I thought to ask it anyway for those uh, Russians who still come to Kazakhstan or those who stayed, because you said many of them came back. Uh, mm -hmm. How would you wish them to behave or live in those spaces? Would you expect them to do in order to uh, yeah, not take the position of power and uh, imperial position where they come from, but perhaps live in a different way and start living more into, yeah, in a decolonial way of coming into Kazakhstan and living there? Some of it is very similar to what I've been doing by migrating in different countries where I've lived in different countries. I always know that there has to be some sort of um, level of respect and understanding of the way things are done. Like you cannot go into a certain country and demand that people, for example, know the language that um, may be completely foreign to them, you know. So there is always... You know, whenever you travel somewhere, there always has to be a way of understanding the local culture and understanding the things, um, like how things are done and doing, like interacting with it respectfully. But at the same time, I think in the case of people who have migrated from Russia, it is um, much more complicated because, well, firstly, we have to recognize that they are in some ways, like uh, I, I would not use the the label refugee because it is uh, definitely not the case. But they, a lot of them, are maybe feeling unsafe in their home country, so they have to, had to change it. So they are going through some sort of like stressful times. However, I would say that the main thing that I would expect from those people is definitely educating themselves on the power dynamics that exist between them and the Kazakhstani people that they encounter. Because it's not as if they're coming like a, just like a normal tourist or just... To um, a neutral place yeah. without uh, history. Yes, because for example, like if, if someone from, let's say, Uzbekistan migrated to Kazakhstan, it would have been a very different case than someone from Russia migrating to Kazakhstan because it is um, a person that comes in and that the person who is maybe used to seeing Central Asians in only um, very lower class, very like uh, very menial labor positions in um, its own country. And it has maybe certain stereotypes, or certain ideas about how Central Asian people are and maybe sometimes using those things against them or um, not really fully recognizing the humanity of um, the community that is that is currently sheltering like th this person. And I think recognition of humanity, recognition that Central Asians have like their lives and their culture has just as much value as uh, um, Russian lives and Ru Russian culture. I think this understanding is extremely key for anyone to be able to say that they're actually approaching this uh, from the perspective of not just coming in and basically like resettling on Central Asian land, but coming in and finding shelter, coming in and finding maybe like a new life, um, a new start, uh, which is very much possible. Like I don't think it, all of us should just like, you know, I'm someone who is an immigrant as well. Like I'm, I, I did not stay where I was born and I wouldn't want anyone to like force them to do that. But I think a lot of the times Central Asians have been reduced to our identity and to our otherness um, in the discourses of the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, and then the Russian Federation. And we have been kind of positioned as 
almost like we have to have a certain subservient position. And if we don't, then it's a threat, which is why there's so many like uh, media people uh, in Russia right now speaking out against um, like what they perceive as a threat against Russian culture, Russian language and Russian people in Kazakhstan, because they believe that there is basically Russian identity takes precedence over other cultures and specifically Central Asian culture, Kazakh culture, Uzbek culture, etc. So I think point, pointing out this specific thing and uh, bringing some sort of level of understanding the way that there's like decades and centuries of um, historic development at work here that kind of made it very ordinary, made it uh, very trivial for someone from the Russian Federation to see Central Asians as a resource that they may or may not use as something that they can uh, maybe like um, adapt to their own needs to understand that this is not something that is natural, that it's not something that is simply because um, like R- Russia happened to develop in ways like much more advanced than Central Asia, that this is the way it is, and it's a natural order of things, and this is why um, like Central Asians should be um, should maintain this uh, more subservient position, and they should be happy that uh, Russian uh, migrants are coming to the region. Um, there has to be an understanding that if you feel a certain power dynamic between yourself and Central Asians, maybe it is a good thing to interrogate and to interrogate specifically from a historical perspective, a historical perspective that recognizes what uh, coloniality is and how it persists even after Kazakhstan has gained independence, how it persists in international relations, how it persists in economic, uh, in trading, even in like uh, cultural conversations, etc. So I would say observing this type of understanding in a person um, or an open-mindedness in a person about learning those things, it is definitely um, something that makes me feel hopeful that there is a way for people to seek safety and shelter um, without necessarily like bringing up all of this like old scars from the history between Central Asia and Russia. I feel very privileged to listen to you. You're a, you're a very, very uh, smart person and uh, ex- you're explaining it in a very, very yeah, accessible and a great way. I feel uh, I got so much already from listening to you and I hope uh, my uh, listeners will do the same. And you I hope so too. just mentioned that you're so uh, also hopeful about all the things and developments happening in Kazakhstan and sometimes uh, you feel sad that you're in between and you cannot be there. So with this last part, last question, I wanted to bring you a little bit uh, to the home feelings and the podcast is always finalized by speaking about food, food from home. I thought about it recently because, uh, well, there was the the New Year's celebration. And uh, we got together with um, some of my friends here who are also from Kazakhstan or Central Asia. And uh, we've been talking about how we kind of try to reclaim a lot of Russian dishes as our own in a way that we we have a very like long tradition of cooking certain, especially like, you know, like salads, uh, like appetizers, or even like, like very simple dishes, you know, that you cook at home, like mashed potatoes and I don't know, like meatballs or something. We still cook them in a way that is very a colonial heritage of like interacting uh, with uh, Russian culture and Russian cuisine for such a long time. But there is a, our own spin on that, like in a way that like we don't eat pork or the way we make certain things. So whenever I think about my mom's food, actually a lot of food that comes to mind is typical Russian food um, Mm -hmm. in a way that you think about this, like the buckwheat, you think about the mashed potatoes, you think about like very straightforwardly made like meat where, you know, like you just cut it and you like, um, uh, you cook it with some vegetables. That's it. Because I think like a lot of the times uh, 
the heritage of uh, the Soviet Union was living in scarcity and was living in a very like very simple ways. Um, Definitely, so I think, yeah. That's why the the cuisine is also like this. I feel a yeah. lot has to do with what was there, right? But there is a way that you 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 make it your own. Like for example, all those like Russian salads that we love to eat for New Year's. I always have to eat them with uh, like Kazakh bread. Uh, which is called uh, borsaki, which is uh, this like, it's like you fry it, you fry the dough. Some people said it reminds them of donuts, but uh, they're not as sweet usually. So like you, like I always like like to eat them together. And, and this creates a very specific Kazakh feeling, you know, like you're eating cool, yeah. a Russian salad. Yeah, like with Kazakh bread. Um, so whenever I think of home, I guess I think about this type of, like dishes where whatever we make at home for lunch or dinner would probably be very regular food that you can find across Central Asia and also like across uh, maybe Russia, Central and Eastern Europe. And then there's also something that we make, something that is Uzbek, not uh, Kazakh, but we eat it all the time is uh, samsa, which is yes. this p- pastry. Yeah, I So like we also... I made those recently. It's so hard to make because did you have your own dough? Or no, did you the just, dough I, I bought, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's uh, that's the best way to make it. But I've seen people like my friend, she made the dough herself and she that's tried so many level, different yeah. times. Yeah, it's very tough. And like I, I, I could never do that. Every time I come home, there is this... Um, like a small bakery nearby from our place. And I always ask my dad, because uh, it's um, on his way back from work. And whenever he comes back, I ask him to go and buy like, like a big bag of them, like 12 of them. Because <laughs> I want to eat so much. And then they like, and I'm like, oh, okay. Like, he's like, oh, like, what if I buy like six? I'm like, okay, but if you buy six, I'm eating all of them and you're not eating anything. So if you want to, if you want to make sure you eat, let's buy 12. (laughs) So you eat your six and I'll eat mine. So that's, I think the food that I miss the most and the food that whenever I see it in the fridge, I can eat it for breakfast. I can eat it for snack. I can eat it for dinner, lunch, whatever. Like I, I can, I think I can eat samsa any point of the day. Now I feel very hungry. But yeah, I, th- I, th- I think those are like the main thing in terms of like day to day food that you can find like in the kitchen. I would say this is the stuff I miss the most. And this was it for today. Thank you for reaching till the end of this podcast episode. The next one is coming in four weeks, always on Monday. Please follow the podcast and leave a rating if you're listening on Spotify. There is two ways you can support the further development of this platform. Number one is to buy the Kitchen Conversations cookbook, Homey Recipes from Artists, that features uh, home dishes from the first 17 guests who appeared on the podcast. And number two is to become a patron of Kitchen Conversations and support uh, this platform with an amount of your choice that starts with 250 per month. More info you can find on patreon.com slash kitchen conversations. In the meantime, take good care and we hear each other soon.